very good to be here with you this evening. Um, I really like teaching in this hall. Uh, this is, to me, it makes you really feel like you're surrounded by Buddhas. And it's very inspiring. We're building a, a new temple at the Abbey. And I talked to the architect. We took pictures. And I said, can we do this? And he said, yes. But it'll cost a whole lot of money. <laughs> and we looked, and we didn't have the money to do it. So we dream <laughs> of another time when, yeah, because it's very uh, inspiring to, to feel like you have Buddhas all around you. Yeah. Okay, so tonight we're talking about anxiety, right? And depression. Oh, two of our favorite things, anxiety and depression. Okay, so who has anxiety? Anybody here? Anybody here have anxiety? One person, two people, or a few more. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. And who of you are, are not telling the truth? <laughs> yeah. I think anxiety, my observation, is that it just, it pervades society now that things are developing so quickly and we all want to be successful right away. And then we get anxious about being able to keep up, be good enough, meet our own expectations, meet other people's expectations. So we get anxious about that. And we judge ourselves way, way, way too hard. And when we judge ourselves so strongly, I'm not good enough. I can't compete, then that can lead to depression. Okay, so we're going to talk about these things tonight and uh, what causes them and what the Buddha said can be used as antidotes to them. Yeah. But first, we're going to do a little bit of chanting. We need to take refuge so we know what path we're following, the Buddha's path. And to generate bodhicitta, the aspiration to become fully awakened so we can be of the greatest benefit to sending beings. And then we know why we're following the Buddha's path. So these first, this first verse that we will recite is very important. Yeah, so we get very clear in our mind what we're doing and why we're doing it. Yeah. And then it will recite the four immeasurables. Yeah, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And that will reinforce our bodhicitta, reinforce our wish to be a benefit to sending things. Okay? Then we'll have a few minutes of silent meditation so that you can calm your mind and your body is here and you need to bring your mind here. Okay? Very often our body is somewhere and our mind is in la la land. You know? thinking about what we want to buy at the grocery store and where we want to go on vacation in five years and uh, do we have enough money in our bank account to pay the bills, things like that. Okay, so we get very distracted and although the body's here, the mind is yeah, making itself miserable, 
with lots and lots of distractions that cause anxiety. So we're going to spend a few minutes just watching the breath, letting the mind settle. And then I'll talk a little bit more about our motivation. And we'll go into the topic of the talk. Okay? Okay. When we chant the Refuge and Bodhicitta prayer, um, it's very good to imagine that the Buddha, surrounded by all the other Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, is they, that they're all in the space in front of you, looking at you with compassion. And by imagining like that, then when we say we're taking refuge and we're generating bodhicitta, we're not just doing it to empty space. Okay, we're taking refuge and we, we have met, visualized the Buddha in the space in front of us. Okay. So take a minute and uh, imagine the Buddha in the space in front of you with his body made of golden light. Surrounded by many other Buddhas and also the great Bodhisattvas. And then have an attitude of really trusting the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha and wanting to generate the same realizations that they have. So develop that trust and that aspiration. And then imagine that there's all the sense of beings are seated around you and so when you take refuge and generate bodhicitta, you're leading all the other living beings in turning to the Buddha for refuge and in generating that precious aspiration to become a Buddha oneself. And then let's contemplate our motivation and think that we will listen and share in the Dharma this evening so that we can learn and practice ways to lessen and hopefully obliterate our anxiety and depression. And we want to do that not just for our own happiness, but the more we're able to tame our own mind and uh, let go of the destructive emotions and generate constructive ones, then the more we can do that, the more we will progress on the path to Buddhahood and the more we will be capable of being of great benefit to all living beings. So that's a very far motivation, far reaching, but let's generate it and go in that direction. So to talk about uh, anxiety, we have to first have a common understanding of what it is we're talking about, okay? So let me tell you how I see anxiety, okay? How I see it as we are uh, looking to the future and feeling uneasy about it and quite worried that something might go wrong or we might do something that is inappropriate 
or people won't like us or you know we'll be impoverished whatever it is okay so we're thinking about something that has not happened yet repeat okay the thing we are getting anxious about has not happened but we're very afraid it will happen so we get worried okay and when we get anxious like that our mind starts to spin oh no what happens if this happens what am I going to do if that happens oh I know this person is going to do this horrible thing and what am I going to do and, oh I don't know how much if I have enough money to to buy a car and I really want a car and you know do I have enough money or am I going to go in debt what's going to happen and my children are they going to get sick and if they get sick you know I'm just going to be so upset and Okay, you, you got what I mean? Okay. None of these things have happened. None of these things have happened. So the anxiety is completely in our own mind. There is nothing on the outside that is happening that is triggering our anxiety okay there is nothing on the outside yeah that has happened that is triggering our anxiety rather our own mind is making up a story okay you know when you're in school you may have been asked to write stories in, you know, your language class. And you go, oh, I don't know what to write about. But if you look at your mind, our minds are constantly making up stories about things that haven't happened. Or maybe they happened a long time ago and we blow them up. And then we think for sure they're going to happen again. So actually, we are very good at creative writing. We make up all these stories. And who is the star of the stories we make up? Who is the main character and the star? ourselves okay so we're making up this whole thing starring that da, 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 me and when we're angry the story we make up is usually a horror story yeah it's not as bad as Frankenstein but Sometimes we can make it that bad, okay? In other words, our imagination can just go crazy and create a scene and then become very obsessed that it's going to happen. Yeah? Have you seen your mind do that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. When you're anxious, are you happy? No, you're not happy. So anxiety is not conducive for human happiness. Why then do we create all these horror stories that make us unhappy? That's a good question, isn't it? 
Why does our mind make up these horror stories? And then we're miserable, but we want to be happy. Quite interesting, isn't it? We want to be happy, and our mind makes us unhappy. So what is the cause of happiness and unhappiness? Is it what's happening outside? Or is it what my mind is making up? Mm -hmm. Now you might say, well, something's happening on the outside. Yeah, it could be there's some little thing happening. But our mind blows it up and makes it for sure going to happy happen. And it's the most horrible thing that can happen to me, and I'm the most important person in the universe, so what am I going to do? Ah. Okay. Ring a bell? <laughs> okay. Now, what do we get anxious about? Yeah, money. Yeah. Everybody is afraid they will not have enough money. I don't know, have enough money to do exactly what, but our mind operates on the premise that we are poor and what we have is insufficient. Okay, so we're anxious about money. We're anxious about what other people think about us. Oh, I just went for a job interview. What do they think? You know, I couldn't pronounce that word properly. Now they're going to think I'm uneducated. Oh no, I won't get the job. Yeah. Or we're anxious about what our family thinks about us. You know, oh, my parents wanted me to do really well in school and get top grades. Oh, but I didn't, you know. I disappointed my parents. What's going to happen now? Oh, okay. We're anxious about getting old and getting sick. Yeah, oh no, I'm getting older. That means I don't look as good. I don't look young anymore. That means people are going to ignore me. That means they're going to criticize how I look. Oh no. Yeah, I better do something. And what am I going to do? I've got to look young. Okay, maybe I need some Botox. Yeah. You know Botox? To get to get rid of my wrinkles, you know. And I need some makeup. Yeah. Men wear makeup now too. And my hair is definitely the wrong color. Look. <laughs> Look. It's gray. Yeah. But I think I'm only 30 years old. Yeah, that's how I feel. Except when it takes me a long time to walk up the stairs, then I don't feel so young. What's going to happen when I get old? OK, we're afraid of getting sick. Oh, my little toe hurts. Yeah, do you ever pay attention to your little toe? Yeah. Oh, my little toe is killing me. I'm going to have a broken little toe. Then I won't be able to walk. I'll go to the doctor. The doctor will put a big cast on it, but it won't heal properly. 
and I know that I'm going to be crippled forever and ever, and I'm going to have to be in a wheelchair, uh, you know, all because I hit my little toe on, on the table. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit exaggerated. And what's the big thing we're afraid of? Death. <laughs> yeah, how can I prevent from dying? I don't want to die. I don't know what happens after death. I can't control it. And I want to control everything, but I can't control sickness, aging, and death. And I can't control what other people do. What am I going to do? What am I going to do when death comes? I'm just going to freak out. Yeah. Actually, you know, when I first encountered the Buddhist teachings, and my teacher started talking about death and impermanence, I felt relieved because death is real, and now here are some people who are willing to talk about it. In my family, you didn't talk about death. Because if you talked about it, it might happen. Whereas if you don't talk about it, uh, death won't happen. <laughs> yes, this was the logic in my family. Okay. There was a big uh, cemetery off the highway near, not too far from where we lived. I remember being a little kid and we drive back by the cemetery. I say, Mom, Dad, what's this? It's a cemetery. What do people do in the cemetery? I don't see any people in the cemetery. What do they do? Where are they? My parents don't know what to say. Uh, all they can say, well, they're under the ground. I say, why are they under the ground? Uh, uh, uh. Yeah? They, they don't know what to say. Uh, I really wished that my parents <laughs> could say, Oh, they die. And then I would have said, what does it mean to die? And then oh, that would have really made them be very quiet because they had no idea what happens after death. But this was one of the reasons when I met the Buddha Dharma, you know, the Buddha talked about death. It's a common occurrence. He talked about what happens after death. He talked about what to do if you want a good rebirth and what to avoid if you don't want a bad rebirth. The Buddha was straightforward. And to me, when things are straightforward, then I don't get so anxious about them. Yeah. OK, so I just hit on a few of the things we get uh, anxious about, but I'm sure there's a, a whole other list. Oh, what else do you get anxious about? Your children. How many of you are parents? Okay. Do you get anxious about your children? Yeah. They've got to get in a good education. They've got to be top in their class. They've got to get a good job. They have to have a corner office and some status. Yeah. And they've got to do everything I didn't do. 
They've got to be everything I haven't been able to be. Yeah. So you have this little kid, you know, little kids when they're born. I mean, how big are they? Yeah, they're little. But you have their whole life planned out. Yeah, you're going to go to this school and then you're going to take exams and you'll get into that school. And then, you know, you'll go to this university and you'll get that job. You know, I wanted to be a, what did I want? I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Yeah, my kid's got to be an astrophysicist because I wasn't able to be, and it's such a good profession. Anybody know what they do? Doesn't matter. It sounds good. It sounds like your kid will be rich. They will be famous. They'll discover something. Yeah? And they'll win a Nobel Peace Prize. And then when they go up to accept their Nobel Peace Prize, they'll say, it's all due to my mother and father. And you'll feel so good. But what happens if my kid doesn't like school and doesn't want to go to that much school, you know, including four years of university and then four years of graduate school and then four years of postdoc and then, you know, by the time they're going to be in school for many years. What happens if my kid doesn't want to do that? Oh, no, they'll be so poor. They'll be out on the street. I won't be able to support them. And they're supposed to support me when I'm old and sick and infirm. And they won't be able to do that. And what am I, what's going to happen to me? Hmm? Okay, yes. Let me tell you, I did not make up these examples before I came here. This is showing how easy it is for our mind to spin out and make up crazy examples and then think they're going to happen. Yeah? My mom would get very anxious. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the disadvantages of anxiety. My mom would get very anxious. Anybody here have anxious parents? One. Two. N nobody else's parents are anxious. Three. Four. Five. Okay, well, I'll talk to those five people because the rest of you don't have parents that are anxious. <laughs> Which means that they don't care about you. Yeah, because how do parents indicate how much they love their kids? By worrying and being anxious what's going to happen to them. Yeah. So when I was a teenager, yeah, I wanted to go out with my friends. Yeah, that's what teenagers do. You want to go out with your friends, and you don't want your parents to tell you what time to be home. Yeah, but your parents tell you what time to be home, and it's always earlier than you think is fair because the kids across the street don't have to be home that early. Okay, so that was my situation. And I knew that if I was one minute late, literally one minute late, after I was supposed to be home, my mother would be so anxious that she would be calling the police and saying, 
My daughter's been in a traffic accident. She's been kidnapped. Go, get all your police out there and look for her. What happened to her? And very often, I would just be sitting out in my friend's car in front of the house where she could see me if she looked. But she'd get that anxious anyway. Okay. So for those of you parents who happen to be anxious, may I make a plea to you. It is miserable being the child of anxious parents. Yeah, so please, for your child's sake, calm down. Yeah, because when you're with, you have a parent that's so anxious, then you feel like you have to do everything perfect or else your mom is going to be calling the police. Yeah? And then the police will go all around looking for you. Yeah? And you're sitting outside in front of the house talking to, your, to a friend. Yeah? And then what are you going to say to the cops? Yeah. And then what are you going to say when you walk in? And your mother doesn't say, oh, I love you so much. She says, where the hell have you been? I was so worried about you. Don't you know how much I worry about you? Why are you so inconsiderate? Mm -mm. Yeah? Any of you uh, act like that or had that experience? Oh, one person. Mm. Yeah. Some people look like they know what I'm talking about, but they don't want to admit it. Okay. Yeah. So please, for your child's sake, relax. Yeah? Your job as a parent is to instill good values in your child, to teach them good behavior, and to teach them how to handle different situations that they may never have been in or never have expect. Yeah? So your job is to teach them in that way. Yeah? And of course, to comfort them and love them. Yeah? Your job is not to be hysterical, frantic, over what's happening to your kid. Yeah? That will not help your child at all. And it will not help your relationship with your child. I don't know, maybe Chinese parents are a little bit different. But in America, yeah, if parents are frantic about their child all the time, then very often the kids just stop talking to their parents. Yeah? Because every time they say something, the parent gets so afraid that something's going to happen to them. Okay. So if you want your, to have your kids to have an open relationship with you, yeah, don't think that worry means love. Yeah. Worry doesn't mean love. Worry means you care about yourself because you don't want to experience any pain or discomfort. Yeah? Because, you know, worry, anxiety, fear, yeah, they all have some kind of central theme of the future. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't control what happens. And so 
I dream up the worst case scenario and then get upset. Uh -huh. Okay. So, what do we do about anxiety? I think, first of all, to observe when we are making up stories. Yeah. Observe what our mind is thinking. And if our mind starts thinking something that is way off in the future and not very reasonable, then bring your mind back to right now. Right now, you're sitting here, you're safe. Yeah. So, do what you can to be of benefit to other living beings. Okay. So, in our world, there's lots of things to worry about, not just uh, personal, you know, things in our personal life, but you could really spin out on worrying about the country or the world. Yeah. I remember after 9-11 uh, in the U.S. in 2001 when, you know, the terrorists slammed planes into the World Trade Center yeah, and into the Pentagon. And, you know, the more it happened in the morning, before it happened, before we knew, anybody knew, it was just a normal day. Then the TV, you know, shows pictures of people jumping out of buildings and smoke everywhere. And, you know, the whole thing in New York is absolutely crazy. Yeah. We were 3,000 miles away on the West Coast. But that doesn't matter. You're 3,000 miles away. Everybody just goes, oh no, the whole country is going to get bombed. Yeah, the whole country, they're going to do a terrorist thing on the whole country and, you know, just blow everything up and ruin the country and, you know, it's, there's going to be a nuclear war and da 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 da. People were so anxious. Yeah. None of what they were anxious about happened. Yeah. Actually, what the, what the government did caused more problems, I think. Yeah. Because what did the U.S. government do? They started a war in Afghanistan and then another one in Iraq. Did they need to do that? Mm, we're not so sure. Okay. But through this, we can see when anxiety takes over our mind, we often do not see situations very clearly. And when we can't see situations clearly, and we're making up horror stories, starring me, of course, then the actions we do very often create more problems for us. Yeah. Whereas if we're able to stay calm yeah. and just be where we're at, yeah, at this moment I am safe, yeah, Things are not on fire, it's okay. Uh, then you can see things more clearly. And if something can be done and needs to be done, then you can do it. And it'll turn out well because you were able to think clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So noticing when we're anxious Okay, being able to label it, I'm anxious, 
to say the word, I'm anxious, I'm making up stories. Yeah. And I'm just going to come back to what's happening right now. I'm with wonderful people in a safe place. So I want to contribute to the welfare of the world. That's all. However I can contribute, I will do that. Okay? Then you relax. Now, sometimes bad things may happen after you get anxious. Yeah. Can we control everything in the universe? Yeah. We can't. When we really look at our lives, there's a lot of things we can't control. We can't control uh, sickness, getting sick. We can do what we can to prevent it, wearing masks when COVID is spreading. But we can't control COVID, okay? We can't control aging. It's going to happen whether we want to or not. We can't control our death. But we can think ahead of how we, what would be a good way to think and to view the situation. Yeah. Okay. So, so personally, I'll, I'll take death for an example. Yeah. It's probably the worst one. Yeah. Nobody wants to die. But if I think, you know, I don't know when I'm going to die, I won't be able to control when I die or how I die. But when I die, I want to have a peaceful mind, okay? So what can I do now to have a peaceful mind when I die, okay? First of all, I can start to purify my negative karma, okay? Purification is very important. Yeah, not only so that that negative karma won't ripen, but also when we create negative karma, we often feel uh, tension inside. Things are, the situation is not resolved. Yeah. So anything in my life that isn't resolved, I want to try and resolve it as much as possible. So what kind of things am I talking about? Well, maybe I quarreled with a good friend or I quarreled with a, a family member. And when I quarreled, I said all sorts of horrible things that I felt at that time. But after I calmed down, I realized, how could I have said that? to the people I care about most in the world. And then I feel regret. And I might even feel guilt or shame. Okay, so I need to clear that situation up in my mind because I don't want to be thinking about it when I die. Okay, so what do I need to do to clear up that situation? so that I feel peaceful about it. <coughs> Purification practice really helps. Yeah, I regret what I did. I try and restore the relationship. So maybe I go to the other person and I apologize. My mind goes, apologize. I don't want to apologize after what they said to me. But to think about it, what did I say to them? It was actually worse than what they said to me. I need to apologize. I need to swallow my pride, swallow my arrogance, and go and say, I'm sorry. What I did 
was wrong. That doesn't mean I'm a horrible person. Yeah, it just means I made a mistake. Yeah, if I can acknowledge my mistake and clean it up, then it's not weighing over me. But if I don't acknowledge it and make some kind of a determination not to do it again, then that situation is always in the back of my mind. And I don't feel good about it. Okay, so Buddhist practice recommends that every evening, well, let's start at the beginning of the day. Every morning, we generate a good motivation before we even get out of bed. And we think today, as much as possible, I'm not going to harm anybody. Today, as much as possible, I'm going to benefit others, even in small ways. Okay. Today, as much as possible, I'm going to try and be kind. I'm going to try and point out to others their good qualities you know, instead of picking faults. Because I have a bad habit of picking faults. Yeah. And I can pick faults, but I don't feel so good about it. So I need to really watch my behavior and not do that. Mm -hmm. Okay? So if I can make that determination at the beginning of the day, and then throughout the day, remember what my determination was, keep reminding myself, and then in the evening, look over what I did during the day, yeah. and if I went counter to my aspiration, my determination, then I do some purification practice, and I clean it up right then and there. Yeah. Now, sometimes the people that we harmed, they live far away. Some of them may have died. We can't call them up and apologize. Okay. But in our own heart, yeah, we can apologize to them and we can forgive ourselves. And that's important to do, okay? So then when I die, I'm not going to be thinking about those things. That's one thing that will make me peaceful, okay? How else do I want to die? Or at least my mental state. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to not be attached to anything in this lifetime. I don't want to cling to anybody or anything. My teacher had the image, yeah, I really like this, of when we die, we're like a boat standing uh, on the edge of a ship. I mean, it's, we're like a not a boat, a bird standing on the edge of a ship. And the bird takes off and it flies. It doesn't go, oh my God, what do I have to do? I have to fly now. It doesn't take off and look back and say, oh, but I really want to be in that ship. How come I can't stay longer? The bird, when it flies, it doesn't go, oh, what's going to, what, where am I going? What's going to experience? What, what am I going to experience? Yeah, the bird, the bird just takes off and flies. I don't know about you, but I like that image. You know, when you die, you just take off. 
Yeah? You dedicate your merit from, the pre from your life. You don't worry about anybody that you're leaving behind. You don't grasp onto anything. It's just time to take off. And you flap your wings and go, okay? And you and a bird, when a bird flies, do you see a trail behind it? Yeah. You don't see a trail, do you? It's just empty space and the bird flies freely. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? I'm dying. I'm not hanging on to anything in the past. I'm going forward with an aspiration to have a good rebirth where I can continue practicing the Buddha's teachings. Yeah. I go forward with compassion, whoever I encounter in my next life. May I have compassion and treat that person well? Then you just go. Hmm? So that's how I would like to die. If I died at this moment, can I do that? Mm, I don't think so. Yeah. Because if I can't handle my anxiety now, how am I going to do it at the time of death? Yeah. So that means that I've got to be quite careful and mindful. And if my mind starts getting anxious and inventing stories, stop. Yeah. Press the stop button. <laughs> Because you may find that some of the stories you invent, you repeat again and again and again. Yeah. If you're worried about money, every day you're worried about money. Yeah. And you're sure that by next week, you and your family are going to be living on the streets with a sharp shopping cart, you know, begging. You're sure that's going to happen. I'm glad you're laughing, because we need to learn to laugh at how silly and stupid our mind is sometimes. Yeah? Really? Really? I'm going to be out on the street with a shopping cart begging? Come on. That's not what's going to happen. You know? And maybe I'm so worried about money because I buy many things I don't need. Yeah. If I controlled my spending habits, I wouldn't worry so much about money because I wouldn't spend so much on frivolous things. Right. Oh, what an idea. Yeah, cut back on what I'm spending. Then your mind says, but, 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 you know, I really need a new pair of shoes. I know it's my 20th pair of shoes, but I really need it. You have two feet. Why do you need 20 pairs of shoes? <laughs> yeah. You're going to wear two of them. What's going to happen to the other 19? Yeah. OK, maybe you need another pair for rainy weather. And you need some slippers around the house. But I don't think you need army boots. I don't think you need stilettos. You know stilettos, five-inch heels? 
how in the world do people walk in those? Yeah? I don't know how they do it or why they would do it. It totally wrecks your feet and your legs. Anyway, you can, you don't need stilettos, yeah? You don't need the most expensive shoes. If you look at what you had, I bet we don't really need everything that we have in our house. So if we didn't spend so much money, then we don't have so many financial problems. Yeah? Then we can use some of the money to be generous, and when we do that, we create merit. That's another thing we can do to prepare for death. Create merit. Yeah, because if we've created merit by being kind and compassionate, and generous, and keeping good ethical conduct and controlling our temper and so on, when we can do that, yeah, then as you create merit, you feel buoyed by the merit, like the merit is supporting you. It's a strange feeling, but, you know, when I look back at how I felt when I first met the Dharma and now, yeah, I haven't created very much merit, but what I have, there's a feeling of, of being um, satisfied or supported by having created merit, yeah? So when we do that, again, at death time, we don't need to worry. Okay? So, you, you see there's things that we can do, you know, and we, don't, we certainly don't need to be anxious about those things. You know? Shantideva was a great uh, 8th century Indian sage, and he wrote a book called Engaging in the Bodhisattva's Deeds. This is one of my favorite Dharma books, because Shantideva, when he teaches the Dharma, it's in simple words, and he, he doesn't let our selfish mind off the hook. Yeah. Our mind starts to make excuses for our bad behavior, and Shantideva shoots them down one after the other. Okay? So one of the verses in this text says something, and now I am paraphrasing. If there's a problematic situation, and you can do something about it, do it. No need to worry or get anxious. If there's a problematic situation and there's nothing you can do, then also no need to worry or get anxious. So think about it. Yeah. I mean, it's just basically four lines in one verse. But wow, if there's something, there's a problem and there's something you can do about it, don't worry. Do what you can do. You know? And if you're busy doing something about it because you've thought clearly about what to do, you're not frantic, you're not freaking out, yeah, you just do what needs to be done, then you don't need to worry. But if there's a problematic situation and there's nothing you can do about it, then also no need to worry because there's nothing you can do. Yeah. It's a beautiful verse, isn't it? Yeah. Think about it. You can change it slightly when you're angry and say, if there's 
something I'm angry about that I can solve, solve it. If there's something I'm angry about but I can't control what's happening, relax. It's the same kind of thing. So it's so interesting because it's so obvious when you think about it. But our mind forgets this all the time and instead, you know, spins out on <laughs> Another thing that can be very helpful when you're anxious is just to sit there and breathe. Okay, now you'll notice if you're anxious or afraid or worrying, your breathing is very shallow. When you inhale, it only goes to here. It doesn't go down to here. It's like, mm. yeah. So if you notice your breath is like that, that's an indication, uh-oh, I'm anxious. Okay, let's just sit there and feel the gentle flow of my breath as it goes in and out. I'm not thinking about that situation. I am just watching. And the gentle flow of the inhale, the gentle flow of the outhale, exhalation. So I'm no longer breathing. <laughs> yeah, because your our breath matches what we're feeling inside. You can tell a lot about somebody by observing how they breathe. Yeah. It's quite interesting. Yeah. But that's one way just to, you know, come back to the present and breathe. Mm. Okay. So I think I've talked long enough. We can have a couple of questions or comments. Yeah, so this is your chance. Please ask whatever you like. And don't get anxious about, I'm going to ask a stupid question and everybody's going to think I'm dumb. Please, you know. If you have a question, chances are other people in the room have that same question. And even if they don't, do you really think they're going to think you're stupid? And even if they thought you were stupid, why do you care? Why do you care if somebody thinks you asked a dumb question? Does, that, does what somebody else thinks of you, is that who you are? Yeah. It's not. It's what we evaluate our own actions, check our own motivations. Okay, so questions, comments? So I have questions. Mm -hmm. um, when um, when we have uh, I have the depression and then uh, when my emotion is very now and I have no strength to change the situation, then what should I do? Okay. So there's a situation you don't feel like you have the strength to change it. Yeah, then what did I just say five minutes ago I, when I quoted Shanti Deva? Then what do you do? Focus on your breath. Yeah, focus on your breath and just relax because you can't do anything about it. 
Yeah. I think we should all copy this verse out. Yeah. And keep it handy so that when we need it, we'll remember it. Yeah. Like you're on your way to the airport and you get a flat tire and you're going to miss your flight. Yeah. If you get all freaked out, oh, I'm going to miss my flight. What's going to happen? Then I have to get another flight. I might have to pay more money. Then I'm going to arrive late. Nobody will be there to pick me up. Oh, what am I going to do? Why did I get a flat tire? Oh, la, 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 la. Yeah? Is that what you want to do? Can you do anything about it? If you get a flat tire on the way to the airport? I think you can do something. I can't. Okay, but if I'm in the car with him, he can. <laughs> yeah, he's real good at fixing things. Or maybe I could flag somebody down. And they, they, you know, or I could call some, a friend on the phone. Or I could call a towing place to, tow, you know, come out and help me and change the tire. Yeah. I might still miss my flight. Is it the end of the world? No. You just book another flight. Maybe you get there a day late. But then, oh, but I got there a day late and my best friend from primary one just got married and I missed it. Oh. Okay, you missed their wedding. Is that a national catastrophe? Yeah. You get there the day late, you still see them. They're probably still having a party. Yeah. It's not a national catastrophe. Okay. Okay. Other comments or questions? I have one question. Um, how do you suggest or request or suggest how do we reconcile between Planning ahead, like what the successful people will tell us, planning five years or ten years ahead, mm -hmm. and at the same time being worried about our future. So you're asking how can we plan ahead? How do we reconcile these two different of planning ahead and also being, being anxious? Yes, anxious or worried. Okay. One of the foremost lessons my teacher teaches us, okay, is that whatever you plan will not happen. Okay? He would say, we're starting teachings at 7 o'clock. So you're there. 7 o'clock comes, it goes. 8 o'clock comes, it goes. 9 o'clock comes, it goes. Maybe he'll start teaching at 10 o'clock, sometimes at 11 o'clock. Yeah, my big lesson from this is, you know, you, when you have a plan, you know what won't happen. Yeah. And, you know, in our monastery, we, we talk about this a lot because at the beginning of the day, we all have an idea of what we're going to do that day. You know, we have different departments. Everybody has different jobs. And we, you know, have a plan for what we're going to do that day. And when people come to the monastery, they think, yes, we plan and then we do it. Very simple. But you plan. And then about 10 minutes afterwards, there's some new situation that happens. And 
you can't do what you plan because you have to pay attention to this new situation. Yeah. And so people at first, they just freak out. Oh, I had my whole list of what I was going to do. And I couldn't finish it. I couldn't even start it. Yeah. And I say, well, that's a big thing that you're learning by living here, isn't it? Yeah. How many of you make a list of the things you want to do that day? You're talking about five years. Do you do something for one day? Oh, you don't for, f for one day? Then why do you plan five years? <laughs> yeah, five years is only one day after the other. Yeah. I was with my brother one time. Yeah, he's not Buddhist. He doesn't understand what I'm doing. And he said, in five years, how do you see your life? What do you want to be in five years? And I said, I want to be a kinder person. <laughs> what? That's your five-year goal? You want to be a kinder person? But look, you could do this, and you could have that, and you could go here and there. And why aren't you planning all of those things? Uh, it's just because those things are really not so important in my life. In my life, what's most important is don't harm anybody and be of as much benefit as I can. Yeah, I'm not going to plan five years from now. You know, our monastery just had its 20th year anniversary. And some of my friends that I knew from 25 years ago, you know, Dharma friends came. And they said, did you ever think you would be doing this? No, I never thought I would start a monastery. I never thought I would be in charge of a monastery impossible. But your life so often turns out different than how you plan, you know. And if you give yourself space, it might turn out better than you have planned, you know. And even if you have obstacles that arise, if you learn from those obstacles, then you have a feeling of satisfaction for living, even though things didn't turn out as you wanted them to. You found that you can be resourceful, you can be flexible, you train your mind to adapt to new situations. Yeah. So often, you know, people, um, one of the nuns at our monastery, she's a physicist, so she likes math and all that stuff. She does everything with um, spreadsheets, yeah? Even, uh, you know, she's doing a certain dharma practice where we count the number of mantras or the number of prostrations we do. She has a whole spreadsheet about you know, how many prostrations I can do in, in five minutes, and on Monday morning I do this many minutes of prostration, so I accomplish that. But if I, you know, uh, I'm slow, then I only do this and fewer, and if, but maybe I do my prostrations fast, so I get them all. Plan a whole spreadsheet, yeah? To count 100,000 prostrations. Yeah. I did the same practice years ago. Yeah. And I just figured out when I was chanting the prayer approximately how many prostrations I said with chanting the whole prayer. And then I would just chant it and prostrate. And I figured that's an approximate number, good enough. And then I collected it. It was no big deal to me. Yeah. Once I stopped 
getting so anxious about, oh, I've got to finish 100,000. How much is it going to take me to, yeah, it's going to take me oh, so long. What am I going to do? Oh, what happens if my knees hurt? Yeah? Jesus, you know, relax. Let your life happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll stop for this evening. And tomorrow uh, and Sunday, we will continue talking about compassion, right? That's the thing. Okay. And to be compassionate, you can't be anxious. Compassion is not, oh, I'm so worried about all sentient beings. Oh, dear. Yeah, how are you going to benefit anybody if you're like that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's just come back to our breath for a moment. And let's rejoice that we were able to create so much merit this evening talking about something that is useful and talking about how, what the Buddhist approach is to handling different problems. You know? And then let's think about this when we go home. Because if we do, then we won't create as much negative karma, and we'll be able to create much more constructive karma. So let's rejoice that we learned something this evening. And let's rejoice also that everybody here learned something and created merit this evening. So when we rejoice in other people's merit, it multiplies our own merit. So as a group, together, we did something quite good. Let's be happy about it.